Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can. I hope you can all hear me, okay. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lucy Lally, I'm the uh, Associate Director for Professional Development within the Q community. And I'm going to be chairing today, which basically means uh, keeping an eye on time and uh, helping with some of the questions later. Brief introductions before I hand you over to Naomi. Um, so thank you for taking the time to dial in over what might be your uh, your lunch hour. Um, Matthew Meze is also here, um, Community Manager for Q. He'll be helping us to feed some. Um, a quick bit of housekeeping before um, we get into the session. We will be recording this and we'll be sharing it on uh, Q's YouTube channel. As many of you will know, um, it's quite a popular way of looking looking at some of the um, content and data afterwards after you've had some chance chances for it to percolate in your mind. Um, I will also do a quick plug for another webinar that we'll be running um, next week on the 9th of December with Hugh Coffey, National Director at Improvement. We'll send you some details about that after this session. So on to today, really delighted to have Naomi Phillip with us. Um, thank you, Naomi, for giving up your time to come and share and a really important topic area for the Q community. I know we talk about this a lot in Q. Um, Naomi is the Professor of Healthcare Organization and Management in the Department for Allied Health Research at UCL. Allied Health Research. Allied Health Research, research um, at UCL and visiting Professor Ankin College. So Naomi um, led the Quality and Safety in European Hospitals program. She'll be talking about that today. And uh, some of that work was identified in relationship with the maturity. So Nemi will be drawing on her work and sharing some of her insights um, with us and then we'll have some questions at the end. So Nemi, I'll give it to you to get started. And if any of you would like to introduce yourselves, please do on the chat. Matthew uh, will be on the chat. Say hello to one another. It's always an opportunity to make some new connections and new webinars as well. Thanks, Nemi. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Stacey. And uh, thank you very much to everybody for dialing in. And good afternoon. So, um, the improvement. I hope you can all see the slide. Um, I guess shout or put them in the chat box part. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, um, to get to the next slide. Perfect. In the next um, 25 minutes or so um, is briefly some policy and research background, which some of you may well be familiar with already. Uh, and then as Stacey says, I'm going to talk through um, program of research with you in the role of improvement, um, which is actually the only um, and drawing out some lessons for the leadership team, um, as well as for the regulators. And there's some further information at the end of the slides, links to papers that I'm referencing and uh, kinds of resources. Uh, and we'll be sharing the slides, uh, as I understand it, afterwards, uh, so you can um, so you can look those up. Um, so. Uh, could I interrupt? It would be useful if people put their phones on mute because there's a lot of interference coming uh, across. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So I think Matthew's going to mute everybody. That would be great. So, um, Okay, I'm now muted, so that's good. Hopefully you can all hear me. So there's um, been growing policy attention internationally on the role of boards in um, supporting high quality care and in quality improvement. So a concern that boards focus on uh, finance and external performance standards at the expense of quality. So we are very familiar with the Francis inquiry following the mid-staffs, um, uh, serious failings at mid-staffs. Uh, which really highlighted um, the issue of culture uh, at, at board level, uh, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, found to be kind of throughout the uh, organisations, uh, throughout the organisation. Um, and so there's been since then 
um, in the NHS, um, regulators attempting to strengthen board level governance of quality and an increasing um, focus on that. There's also been increasing um, attention of research on the role of boards. And on this slide, I just highlight some of the uh, research studies and findings. Um, there, are, uh, th there are more than this. And if you look at some of these, you'll, you'll see in the references. So, um, um, so JAR and Epstein, for example, in the US and the UK found um, that board composition and processes um, helps to be able to distinguish between high and low performing boards. Um, a number of effective hospital uh, uh, boards were associated with specific management um, practices. Um, the role of clinical leaders has been found at board level, uh, has been found to be uh, really um, important. Um, and Naomi Chambers were looking at kind of five years post Francis and how boards are, have responded uh, is um, a useful um, resource to look at as well. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, talk you through the program and very briefly share sort of some of the findings. So it started with what we call the Quasar study, um, from, which ran from 2010 to 2013, which was funded by the European Union um, Framework 7 program, um, which produced um, this thing we called the Quasar Guide. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through that. Uh, we then um, were fortunate enough to be able to um, implement that and evaluate the implementation of the guide. And so we call it the iQuasar study, in implementing Quasar, which ran from 2014 to 2017. And there's two aspects of that. Uh, on the left hand side is the evaluation of the implementation of the Quasar guide and the wider study on how boards govern. So that's kind of work I'm going to talk you um, through very briefly and um, again at the end there's a number of publications associated with each of these studies I'm not going to obviously talk you through all the findings so if you're interested in further findings um, you can um, check out those so the Quasar study as I said uh, ran from 2010 to 2013 it was funded by um, EU Frank 7 program um, we looked at quality and safety in um, hospitals in five European countries uh, which were Norway, Sweden, um, England, um, uh, and, uh, 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 Portugal, uh, and the Netherlands. Um, so uh, the framework uh, that we used uh, for the study and then actually for the guide, um, we drew on and developed a framework um, which had been um, um, developed in a study uh, published as Organising for Quality uh, by uh, Paul Bate and Glenn Robert and others, which some of you may be uh, familiar with. Um, and so this framework um, uh, denotes eight challenges. So it's the eight challenges of quality uh, improvement. And um, they cover things like, you know, structural, that's the blue circle, if you can see that. Um, so that's how, um, how uh, uh, quality efforts are planned and coordinated, for example, through a quality committee and through governance processes. Um, the educational challenge in green, which is about creating, nurturing and learning process. Um, there are political, addressing the politics and ne negotiating the buy-in within an organisation. It's small p, political within an organisation. Um, managing the external uh, uh, context you've got there. Um, but also um, what we, um, this, what we call the emotional, the cultural elements of quality improvement, uh, which are just as important. Um, so the emotional element is inspiring, energizing, mobilizing people for quality improvement work, uh, which I'm sure you uh, Q folk are, are very uh, familiar with, and I'm sure you're very good at. Uh, and the cultural element, which is about giving quality a shared collective meaning, value and significance. So, and those, the black lines are really to show that these are all deeply interconnected. And when you're thinking of, this is a heuristic really, it's a way of thinking about quality improvement and the thing and the challenges that need to be addressed. So if you're thinking about, for example, how to um, address the physical and technological aspects of quality improvement. So say you're thinking about, you know, what uh, uh, informa information technology you need and so on and so on. Uh, what we're saying is you also need to think about the educational challenge related to that, the cultural challenge, the emotional uh, challenge. So it's a way of, a, a way of thinking. Uh, uh, 
Um, so there they are, the AQ. So what we found from our study of hospitals in, across um, uh, five uh, European um, countries um, in the sort of early 2010s uh, was a whole number of common features, which we call the bad news, uh, which was a focus on quality assurance rather than quality improvements. So the key drivers were governance, compliance and accountability rather than learning and cultural change. Focuses more on systems, tools and data rather than on changing attitudes, behaviours and cultures. Not to say focusing on systems, tools and data is not important, but it seemed at that point that people were emphasising uh, that. The quality improvement work largely resides at the margins of hospital priorities um, and financial issues took, uh, um, took pre pre precedent. There was a kind of project by project approach um, rather than an organizational wide system wide approach and many of those projects were fantastic uh, and are fantastic um, but there was a kind of lack of strategic oversight um, or, or strategic planning towards quality improvement across a whole organization and let alone the whole system and in terms of think you know what we know our definition of quality clinical effectiveness uh, patient safety and patient experience the focus was much, much more on clinical effectiveness and patient safety and much less on um, patient experience and very limited patient and public involvement in quality um, improvement. So that's what we call um, the bad news. And then in terms of um, where are hospitals in Europe, where the attention was paid to, to challenges overall, uh, uh, slightly more towards structural uh, and educational elements, uh, rather than the kind of emotional and cultural um, uh, challenges. But if you look at England at that time, uh, and this was just, we were um, sort of public, talking about this just as Francis was reporting, um, the focus was very much on structural um, element, the challenges and, and external demands, and much less on leadership, um, internal politics, cultural, emotional aspects. And I remember presenting that at the National Patient Safety um, conference and um, laughter in the audience when I do laughter of recognition um, uh, which uh, was interesting however there was um, uh, and as there always is good news um, and so what we found you know we found lots of you know good examples uh, so for example where um, where senior leadership teams were able to use external demands, so balancing external and internal demands, so use external demands um, to, um, to spur people on internally around quality improvement, rather than seeing uh, regulatory uh, demands as um, kind of grounding, grinding down must-dos, sort of turning them into something um, positive. Um, there was um, quite a lot of creating boundary spanning uh, roles uh, between um, boards and senior leadership teams and the front line uh, and there were some examples involving patients in, in, in quality improvement and what we found was well, what sort of, what things enabled these good news examples well having a long-term commitment to quality improvement of the organization stability of context and leadership uh, which is very easy to say, uh, much less easy to provide, particularly in our context. In other uh, countries, um, uh, they're lucky, fortunate to have more stability in that regard. And that there are pockets of good news, even, even in challenged organisations, bottom-up quality improvement initiatives led by um, very enthusiastic um, frontline um, staff, um, which weren't being used, uh, weren't harnessed effectively by senior leaders and, 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 and the board. Um, so out of all that data, and I've only presented a real kind of snapshot, um, we created and we sort of co-created uh, this um, hospital guide, which is, um, it's not a how-to guide, um, it's a, um, a research-based tool to reflect on and develop quality improvement uh, strategies as an organisation. It can also be used within an organisation, say at divisional level, and I know um, places that have, have used it for that. So it's a, it's a self-assessment um, tool and I'll talk you through a little bit about that. And at the back it's got a whole lo a lot of examples uh, which relate to some of the things I talked about, the good news examples that people can use to reflect on. They're not sort of you should translate this directly into your context but kind of things to, uh, to think about. 
Um, so um, the, guide, the guide is structured in this way. The first stage, uh, 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 a set of diagnostic questions on the, each of the eight quality improvement uh, challenges. So um, helping boards or teams uh, work out which challenge um, they should focus on. So um, for example, having done that, they might say, well, the educational challenge they want to focus on. And then within each uh, challenge, there are a number of strategies and options um, that um, people can um, uh, also self-assess on. How well are we doing on each of these strategies and options? Um, and then, so that's stage 2A, then how this challenge li links with other challenges, um, and through that, develop a coordinated plan for quality improvement implementation. So a plan for your organization or for your division, um, how to um, uh, develop your quality improvement across your division, your organization, and even, uh, and I should say, how we develop that guide, uh, we published recently, and all of, uh, uh, quality in healthcare, um, which um, you might be interested in looking at. So um, having developed um, this guide, we were then very fortunate um, through um, Clark North Thames uh, being able to actually um, implement the guide uh, with a number of uh, trust boards and evaluate uh, that, uh, that Im implementation. So this was to help boards develop their organisation-wide um, quality improvement um, strategies. And as I mentioned earlier, the study had two kind of elements. On the left hand side, you'll see there's a guide plus organizational development. So we work with um, an organizational um, development team who are much more expert in these things than us academics are, um, who kind of turned the guide into uh, a, 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 an OD tool uh, to actually use with um, boards. And we, the researchers, conduct the research a mixed method before and after uh, study of the iQuasar intervention. And we've also done a cost consequence analysis. So that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we looked at um, how quality improvement is governed at board level in general um, and developed a quality improvement maturity framework, which I'll talk, talk you through. Uh, so, and that's across 15 trusts that were in our study. So, both elements of the study. We had 15 provider organizations, 12 acute, two mental health, um, and um, is that one community? <laughs> but what, it's whatever it says there. Um, so we had six um, organizations who participated in the IQUASA intervention, and I'll talk you through what that intervention can And then we had six comparator um, organizations because we wanted to compare um, with organizations that weren't participating in interventions and they were matched on type and foundation trust status and CQC performance ratings where we had those available and then three what we call benchmarking trusts uh, one that had um, was a high performing CQC outstanding uh, one medium requires improvement and one low uh, CQC inadequate um, so those were our 15 provider organizations and we collected um, a lot of um, uh, qualitative data, observations of board meetings, documentary analysis, board meetings, quality counts, and so on, and interviews uh, with, um, with uh, board members. Um, so in thinking first about this, um, what the, uh, the evaluation of the IQAs or intervention, um, so the intervention consisted of four phases over a 12 month period. So first of all, we introduced the program to the board at meetings. Um, and then they went through a self-assessment uh, process and um, discussed, uh, which was then, so, for, so I'll talk you through that. So this is just a snapshot of the uh, online uh, assessment tool that board members uh, completed. The survey took about 20 minutes to complete um, and um, they uh, was a self-assessment on the organization in terms of each of the eight challenges uh, and then the um, strategies uh, within, within those. Uh, and from those um, results, um, the OD team we worked with um, fed back to each organization the, the findings uh, and, uh, what, and sort of pointing out which kinds of areas they might want to focus on. 
which they discussed uh, in a forum. Sometimes that was a quality committee. Sometimes that was in a seminar, uh, wherever made relevant to them. Um, and then we had um, the OD uh, team um, facilitated a, a workshop and three action learning sets, uh, which um, board members from each of the organizations uh, attended. Uh, over a uh, roughly six month period. And at the end of that, the idea was that um, they developed their quality improvement strategy and they also identified a, an organizational wide quality improvement action that they wanted to um, implement. Uh, so I've talked you through that. And this um, incredibly summarizing. So, um, of our six organizations, um, so at the left, on the left-hand side, what you see is um, the kind of level of engagement in the intervention. Uh, and as with any intervention, you're going to have different levels of engagement. And two of our organizations engage very strongly in terms of who they sent to the workshops. One of them, uh, their chief executive, attended everything. Uh, but also the nature of that uh, engagement um, kind of really ran with it. Um, and uh, two engaged uh, moderately um, and two on a much more kind of minimal uh, basis. Um, and then um, using a, a framework previously uh, developed actually in the outside the health sector, in the corporate sector, we kind of categorized uh, their, uh, uh, their, their response and that's here, transformation, customization and loose coupling coupling and uh, corruption. And this is uh, published in a, a paper in BMJ Quality and Safety um, in 2017. Um, so you might want to uh, look that up. So um, uh, you'll see under QI project what it was that they, uh, each of the organizations were, was, um, were, was trying to achieve and then to what extent they had, um, they uh, implemented that. Uh, and then you also see next to engagement quality improvement strategy, uh, whether that, uh, to what extent that had had improved and was at a kind of organizational wide uh, level. Interesting, the two that um, had the kind of most, uh, were uh, most transformational um, uh, impact appointed a director level quality improvement um, post uh, who could lead this whole program. Um, and, um, what was interesting about the ones that actually ran with this was that they used this to do what they had been planning to do in any case. Um, and um, they didn't see it as an add on. They saw it as something that could help them and uh, really kind of push them on to, to the, to the next stage. Um, and then we looked at some of the factors shaping these organizations. Responses. So why did some, why was some able to engage much more strongly than others and, and really So having Slack, thinking space, someone to do the doing, um, uh, which can be shaped by compliance with national standards, being kind of the, the degree of lev uh, readiness of the organization, the stable leadership, some board members with expertise in quality improvement, commitment of the CEO and chair, really uh, important. And I would tell this story, one of the trusts uh, that um, didn't engage uh, so much, although the, um, the, uh, uh, the medical uh, director and one of the other directors was really up for it, um, um, but uh, tells a story of, of going into the chair's office and uh, talking him through it, and he picked up the guide and dropped it on the floor um, to uh, show what he... Um, what he, he thought of that. So, um, and that, you know, made it very difficult for those directors to really progress what they wanted uh, to do within the organization. Um, and it needs a functioning and coherent board. And some of these boards were less functioning in the sense of the degree of turnover uh, that it, they'd experienced. Um, and uh, went through our, the observations of boards, um, how far the board really operated um, uh, as a kind of real board rather than a staged uh, board uh, that you know, others have also observed that, 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 that some do. Um, so uh, second element of the study, uh, how, board, how QI is governed at board level. Um, so we developed this security framework. So um, 
reviewing the literature, um, we found kind of eight dimensions, which you'll see on that left hand side. So, for example, QI is a broad priority using data for improvement. I won't talk you through all of degree of staff involvement, degree of public patient care involvement. Uh, the eighth one's interest in dynamics, how board members challenge us questions of each other, which we were able to look at through, um, through board meetings. And so just to talk you through an example, quality improvement at, as a board level, how did we kind of measure this? So we looked at how much time is spent talking about quality improvement at board meetings, but also how much time is spent elsewhere, not at board meetings. Um, so that we'll come to it, mature boards were able to delegate uh, to the policy committee, for example, um, uh, a, a lot of um, quality assurance and quality improvement. Whether board members had any formal QI training uh, and the proportion of you know, quality assurance versus quality improvement. And so we would give each of those eight dimensions a, a maturity level, high, medium uh, or low. Uh, and we looked at um, their maturity level, uh, which emerged from our findings and CQC ratings there seems to be some relationship uh, between um, CQC rating and maturity level. Of course, we don't know which way around that relationship is, um, um, uh, whether it's, you know, the more mature organisations are able to get the CQC uh, a better, a higher rating, or whether it's the CQC getting a better rating allows you to have the headspace to be more mature. So we don't know the relationship there, but there does it appears to be. Uh, and then we looked at the characteristics of those with a high quality maturity, uh, and I will um, run through those. So the first one was around having a, a longer term, able to have, having a longer term uh, focus on, on quality improvement, um, as well as a short term focus. Uh, and um, in, the, in the green box, you'll see, um, uh, boards having the capacity to be able to create, consider long-term plans, articulate and enact uh, values and expect behaviours, for example, using these as a basis for recruitment and appointment, um, and the corollary, the sort of opposite in the red box, um, short-term focus, li limited capacity to think long-term. Um, patient and staff engagement, those mature organisations had strong engagement of staff and patients in, for example, their quality account, uh, priority setting patients, uh, and all staff with kind of common thread through board agenda items and the opposite um, in the uh, uh, in the red box on, on the right hand side and for example quality accounts our analysis of, of those uh, proved very interesting so some organizations um, really uh, use them as a communication tool within their organization uh, uh, and externally uh, and were um, and paid some attention to their appearance and how they looked and how kind of user friendly they were and others they were kind of huge um, documents in tiny fonts that you know anyone other than us <laughs> pouring through them for this research would lose the will uh, to, to read so it seems a lost opportunity there from some organizations around um, using data for quality improvement, um, the high maturity organisations using them for quality improvement, not just quality assurance, clear and readable, uh, triangulating data in discussions, using more real time data, combining hard data with soft intelligence through walkarounds and patient complaints, using benchmark data with other organisations. And as we know from other work that people have done, uh, some you know control charts being important, being able to look at trends over time, not just snapshots. Um, and then the opposite in the red box. So we saw some organisation um, using um, you know, having a huge volume of data, not clearly presented, um, and not looking at trends over uh, over time. Um, then this culture of continuous improvement was really evident in the high maturity um, organisations, the bowls, um, boards, constant questioning and self-examination, striving for excellence, kind of not resting on their laurels, using external networks for learning, um, looking at how other organisations responded to similar examples, for example, visiting high performing uh, example uh, organisations to learn from them. Uh, and then the lower maturity uh, some of them appearing sort of more complacent, insufficient challenge from the um, non-executive directors and um, overly um, optimistic. 
clinical leadership on boards, as other uh, Varanese has found, are really important. So we found um, the high maturity ones with a high proportion of board members with the clinical background. Um, um, there were positive kind of board dynamics. Um, the uh, clinical leadership was visible and vocal during uh, and helped, particularly helped interpret data. Uh, and then the opposite low maturity. Uh, so in terms of learning for boards, um, the characteristics of um, higher, uh, more mature uh, boards uh, might help boards uh, where they want to focus on. So balancing this long and shorter term focus, uh, using data for quality improvement, not just quality insurance, uh, engaging staff and patients in a meaningful way in quality improvement, um, creating this culture of continuous improvement and the crucial uh, role of clinical leaders. Um, and as yes, others have found that this top of the shop commitment is really important to improving uh, the role of uh, the board in, in quality improvement. And there are learning for, for, there's learning for external bodies and our regulators as well. So enabling slack, so for example, reducing uh, the uh, reporting burden um, in facilitating red, red, readiness and functioning of, 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 of coherent boards. Um, and in terms of OD interventions, targeting to where, uh, where organizations are on their uh, 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 quality uh, journey and not one size uh, fits all. Um, so very briefly, what's, what's happened next? Um, NHS Improvement piloted the board maturity framework uh, with a number of boards. Um, our local academic health science network, UCL Partners, facilitated uh, implementation of Highquasa with uh, five further trust boards. Um, and in terms of our research, we're now um, evaluating uh, the special measures for quality and challenge providers uh, regimes, uh, which um, is coming to fruition at the moment uh, and uh, is providing some really interesting lessons uh, for trusts uh, and also for regulators. So um, watch uh, this space for the findings from uh, that study. Um, so thank you. I realize I've material but I hope it's been helpful and really happy uh, to take comments uh, questions uh, and uh, so on thank you Naomi um, that's that's great and I've got a few questions that have come through from people in the in the chat um, re really interesting and a, a really helpful kind of canter through those key areas of work and um, Naomi pointed to a few different things that um, you could perhaps look at the MJ and we'll, we'll have a look for those ourselves and actually she has a very helpful slide to put it all together already for you uh, do any further reading. It was re I was really interested in um, what you were saying towards the beginning with QI operating at the very margins um, of sometimes teams or wards or organisations and not mm -hmm. having that um, system-wide approach and that's mm -hmm. certainly where Q has come from, those pockets of improvements mm -hmm. um, trying to improve how they might be connected. Um, I'll, I'll ask a quick, quick question because I, I can and I'm being cheeky before I, before I open up to anyone else. But where, where do you think we are now, a few years later down the line, with that, um, that piece? Um, in terms of the sort of quality improvement well, happening at the periphery? Quality, yeah, mm. in terms of it being viewed as at the periphery, because I, because I, think, I, I think I would say, and maybe this is because, because of my involvement in Q, that some of the narrative around that is, is starting to change. Um, and the experiences of how far QI is seen as an add-on mm. may be having a bit of a step change. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think the way people talk about it has certainly mm. changed. Um, I'm not, and, and at kind of board level and amongst the regulators and so on, there's, um, there is um, a lot more talk about that. I'm not quite sure whether how far it's changed mm. kind of in the doing. I think certain organisations um, have really... Um, taking it on and um, you know it, it's you know from board level throughout the organization there's a focus on quality Im improvement um, and as we've seen you know that takes a number of years to really um, achieve that so I think there's been a change um, in in the in the culture mm. in terms of the discussion I'm not sure I think there's still a lot of variability in how that actually plays out within organizations and I think a key part of that is you know, is giving organisations the slack to be able to do yeah. this and the support to be able 
uh, to do it as well. Great, thank you, that's really helpful. Um, right, I'll move on to some other questions. I know they're coming through in the chat. So there's a few in the chat. Um, so Vicky, Vicky McNally, thank you, you said, uh, is there any correlation with engagement levels and the CPC rating? Um, engagement, I'm not quite sure, do you mean engagement by staff and patients or engagement within the intervention? Vicky, would you like to uh, Yes, in? yeah, I've, I've just unmuted you. It was to do with one of your earlier slides and actually I think you answered that. You did think there was uh, a relationship between those higher mature uh, functioning organisations. So, so thank you, I think, think you've answered that, but very interesting, thank you. But yes, you're absolutely right. So the both engagement with staff um, and with patients and the public is uh, really is really uh, fundamental. Um, and I think you know some of the analysis now, you know, people looking at the staff survey um, mm. uh, data, um, and um, you know, know the CQC look at that. Um, it, it, it gives some sort of marker of how far organisations are um, are um, engaging um, uh, with their with their with their staff. Great, thank you. Uh, Charles, Charles Daniels, did, did you want to unmute yourself? You wanted to, um, you had a question around integrated care and place-based? Okay, Matt, if you, ha if you have Charles's question, okay. um, that would be great, thank you. Yeah, so Charles asks, is anyone looking at how this could be applied at a place-based, mm. as a place-based system? to promote integrated care between organisations, for example, acute and primary care stroke PCNs? Primary okay. care networks. Primary, primary care networks, yeah. yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I don't know, um, but um, it definitely um, could uh, be helpful in um, working across systems. One of the, we did, I mentioned the further work we did with UCL partners, and that was, that wasn't, at, that was across three, acute uh, organizations who were which were coming together so that was a way of trying to bring boards together um, but it could well it might well be useful in um, bringing different um, organizations together as you say uh, um, uh, within a system uh, providing different kinds of care um, and um, thinking best how you know, quality improvement in terms of integrated care um, but I don't know of anyone doing that but would be interested to hear if, if anyone uh, was mm, certainly if anyone um, on the call is hearing anything about that then do you do share it with us um, and, and we can join that up um, Jatinda we have a question from you do you want to unmute yourself if you're still there I am can you hear me hi thanks Hello. Jatinda over to you Hi, Naomi. Really, really good presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I've been recently put into a post as head of quality improvement, and uh, and we're in a in a trust which is rated as outstanding. <clears throat> it's um, probably never had a more formal QI approach and methodology. Um, obviously, a step in the right direction by creating a new uh, lead for QI and myself. But um, but there is a bit of work to do to convince them as to why they need to invest and adopt, engage with the whole QI journey because they feel, as you can quite understand, they're you know, very well, um, uh, doing very well from, from all sorts of tests and assurances. So you know, have, you, have you come across that where boards are doing well without ever going down that QI methodology? And if so, trying to introduce it at that level as opposed to where you described really well some organizations that perhaps required improvement and then adopted a QI methodology, there was a good correlation this is quite a different setup I've got. That is very interesting because the ones we looked at, they were, um, they were adopting some <clears throat> formal methodology. And actually, um, uh, it's maybe sort of painless to say, I'm not sure it matters which one you adopt. No. No. Part of, of doing it and also from the board um, um, throughout the organisation. So that that's a very interesting uh that's a very interesting challenge um and i guess um you know i i don't know your organization but make you know one you know it is possible as we know to go to lose an outstanding um badge and um and and slip 
and slip down. So I guess uh, one way of um, persuading people is, you know, they want to um, maintain that, but also to continually, uh, to continually improve, you know, um, improvement never stops, does it? So, um, uh, and I guess the other thing is, I think it's a really good way to engage staff uh, because you know frontline staff want to improve uh, their, 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 the care that they provide uh, the systems and um, they, they're, they're much more willing to engage in that uh, than in, in some, you know than in SIPs and all the other difficult yeah. things that people have to engage with so um, I think if, from that point of view um, there's a, a very, you know hopefully a, a selling point I think uh, so. I'd, I'd agree with you. Naomi. I think one part for me that I am seeing where we're getting a lot of traction is the exec walk arounds where I do take the exec board members to a clinical area and that feedback, which you again highlighted, the soft data from those walk arounds has been really powerful. And that's beginning to just get them a bit more curious and interested into why we might need to have a slightly different approach for all the reasons you've just said. But, but it is a challenge. Um, I'll, I'll share how I get on over the next year. Yeah, I'd be very interested to hear. And the other thing, I mean, in any organisation, there's going to be a variation. And mm -hmm. while, you know, you might, the, your organisation might be outstanding overall, there may be pockets of, um, you know, where things aren't working quite so well. Um, so, yeah, great, great. I think that does, like, the walk, walk around sounds really good. Yeah. Useful way to start. Super. Listen, but, thank you very much. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Jacinda. I'll, I'll move on now. Uh, Katie, Katie Stewart. You have a question for um, for Naomi, if you're still there, if you want to unmute yourself. Oh, hi. Hi, Stacey. Hi, Naomi. Um, my, my experience is that it can be really hard to get going, as you've described, and that, um, but that when you do begin to get going, the board starts to engage with, with perhaps with the frontline visiting clinical teams, getting a bit more curious, raising the aspiration levels. It can become almost a kind of virtuous circle in which the culture of the board becomes one which is much more aspirational and much more open. And I just wondered, Naomi, what your experience was and what can stop that in its tracks? Um, so I, I don't know about stop it in its tracks, but in terms of, yeah, what the kind of barriers to getting that going and sustaining it. I mean, I think um you know understandably um boards um are you know very focused on the external environment and and unfortunately the the kind of the vicious circle of you know organizations that aren't you know performing so well and and then being under much greater scrutiny um mm -hmm. means that it is just um harder uh for them to focus um on um, you know the, the the things that you're that you're talking about, and you know financial uh, pressures, for example. So you know nobody, you know it's, it certainly isn't easy. And the kind of red boxes that I showed, it's not yeah. they're, they're not meant to be criticisms of those organisations. It's really how can we help those organisations turn themselves around and you know not get totally diverted by um, finance issues, uh, for example. Um, but you know it's 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 tricky, and it's about finding that, um, as I said, that that space, that slack for people to to be able um, to um, address those issues. And people like yourselves and Jatinda and other others of you, you know, in the Q community and and, and elsewhere, you know, helping organisations um, to support them to do that. But I think that's right. It's starting small. Uh, and um, you know where the pockets of quality improvement and the sort of enthusiasts and you know getting some of those people to present um, at the board uh, to see how things can be different I think are, are, are really important. Mm, really really helpful so it's just keeping it's just keeping it on your radar all the time. I think so. Even gets a chance. The acknowledgement that it take you know it does take time it's not going to be six months or a year it's if you look at the highly you know successful organizations mm. it's taken you know three four five years uh and it's you know it's keeping it's keeping at it yeah with a couple of kind of structural changes which are which which have to be in place in the first instance like, um, like having having somebody at board level who has it as their key priority or absolutely. a director 
and having you know your, your governance and assurance um, processes have to be right they're necessary but not sufficient but they are necessary if you haven't got those it's very uh, hard to to uh, succeed yeah Absolutely. really think helpful thanks great wonderful thank, thank you. you katie great question so we're just going to take a bit of a, a shift now into finances so fiona um fiona if you're on the line do you want to unmute yourself I have a question for naomi Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> We've lost the screen, so I don't know if you can oh. hear me. If you're Hello? Fiona. I can see your name up there, Hi. Fiona. Yeah, I'm being Fiona at the moment. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, sorry, we've lost the picture on the screen, but if you can hear me, that's all right. You can hear. So my question's about how you. Um, so in our organisation, we have a really great QI team. And I, I do get the feeling that our board are bought into QI. Um, and I've seen lots of presentations from people who've implemented QI projects successfully. And one of the consequences of those has been that there's been a financial saving, although that wasn't the primary objective of it. And then we hear slightly uncomfortable instructions coming. Can we have lists of QI projects that are in progress and the savings they're going to make? And it feels like that's the wrong focus. And in an organization that's really cash strapped and has big financial challenges, you can see why senior managers and boards would think like that. But how do you shift the focus or how do you keep the focus on QI without it being subsumed into um, financial and cost improvement plans and else? Yes. So I think, um, yeah, you, yours is a very important and kind of fundamental question um, so one of the things we we did look at in the, the quasar study was what how uh, hospitals responded to external demands around finance and quality and as I said we're able to kind of use those as levers for change in the organization and for um, I think for in, for inspiring people um, to make change so um, you know it's hard to get people leap out of bed in the morning to make um, um, cost savings, isn't it? Um, and, and, but actually to say, you know, this is about improving the service we deliver to patients. That, you know, is what inspires people. Um, so I think it's about making the argument, uh, you know, that, uh, that staff are fundamental in, to, in an organization and how they feel um, about coming into work uh, and uh, and when they go home um, about the organisation, that that is really that that is really important. And one of the ways um, to engender that is is through quality improvement. Um, and so, um, you know, and all, many healthcare organisations are you know concerned about recruitment and retention, uh, and this is a way, one way of of addressing that. So that might be a way of of kind of slightly decoupling it from the finance agenda but you know i appreciate it is it is very difficult and especially in uh, organizations that are really um struggling financially i don't know if that helps or what you're referring uh, yeah i think so i mean uh, but but i also think that that is the thrust of our qi team um uh, but the, the qi team leads don't sit at exact level and it's coming from exec level that, you know, we, we want to see what the savings are going to be from mm -hmm. IT. Um, so, I, so I think what you said is correct, but the, the QI team, and so I'm, I'm not in the QI team, I'm the deputy divisional director. So I think at our sort of level, that's kind of easy, easy to implement, but mm -hmm. at exec level, the, the pressure's on to make, to save money. And that permeates yeah. down to us. I I think it, it's, you know, if you can get a sponsor at exec level um, and, and, and maybe be that, you know, the chief nurse and or the medical director, that can be helpful. Um, if you can somehow get them kind of bought in and, you know, championing this at board level, um, that could be one strategy um, because we found those folk to be, you know, really important in all of this. Yeah, okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got uh, two more people lined up. So Manesh has a question around the staff survey and then we'll move on to Anna 
um, who has a question around national comparisons. So Manesh, do you want to unmute yourself? You had a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah thank, you. Uh, thank you, Naomi. That was that was very useful. Going back to the last question, I think um, in terms of saving money, any adverse incidents you save, any improvements you make in care, you're saving money in the long term. You may not be easily able to dot the two lines, but uh, I think uh, quality improvement saves money in the long term. So it, there's, it is a, there's a financial merit in, in the quality improvement journey as well, apart from, apart from all the merits. So in terms of, uh, Naomi, my specific question was uh, about the self-assessment you talked about. Was that done only at board level? And secondly, you you mentioned comparing uh, the maturity indices with with the CQC ratings. I was just wondering whether uh, you had also had a look at the staff survey results because there are some questions which can relate to quality improvement and culture and stuff like that. Yeah, so really, both really good questions. Thanks, Minesh. So the self-assessment, um, for most of the organizations did it at board level, but some actually asked, could they do it at um, a divisional level as well? Um, and so, um, so they did. <laughs> um, and, um, that's and what was interesting uh, was that there were, seemed to be differences in the self-assessment uh, between um, how the board level assess themselves and how division, the divisional level mm. assess themselves. And that provoked a conversation, uh, which I think was really important. Um, so that could be something for organizations uh, to, to think about. And, not, and if they have resource, maybe doing it more widely in the organization. And then your second question about staff survey, really good one as well. And um, I mentioned the study we're, we're doing currently on organizations that have been in um, special measures for quality or on the challenge providers list. And we're actually looking at um, some of the uh, staff uh, survey data in that because uh, we didn't look at it in the re re study I presented here um, uh, because we didn't have long enough uh, period of time when they've been collecting data on those, um, uh, on those uh, variables. Um, but the, the current one, we are looking at that to see if um, what the kind of impact uh, of, um, of the interventions within uh, special measures uh, might have on those uh, organizations to help them address those issues. So staff surveys is proving uh, to be a kind of useful tool uh, for researchers and hopefully for organizations uh, uh, as well. And I think, um, if, you know, if um, organizations could push for the to increase the response rates for that. And of course that in itself has been used as a marker for, for, um, for staff engagement. Um, I think that it's a very useful tool. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Emma. Really helpful question, thank you, Manesh. And Anna, if you're there, uh, do unmute yourself. You, you wanted to talk about national comparisons. Hi everybody, thank you for a great presentation. Um, yeah, I guess I'm really interested really at the dilemma that's facing English boards at the moment and I was wondering whether either through Wales or Scotland or any of the other European countries that you looked at, um, you had a sense about whether there was a, there was a kind of um, more of a kind of consistency for boards to consider. Um, I think at the moment in England, if you look at quality improvement training, for instance, that's on offer from national bodies or um, some of the techniques or QI methodologies that are on offer. It's fantastic to have that richness and that diversity. But I think one of the unintended consequences of that is it can make discussions about QI at boards more complex and more complicated because there's actually more choice about what to do. And it almost increases variation. So I'm wondering really whether you've got any examples from um, countries where um, there is really just one consistent approach that's being kind of, um, you know, promoted by their arm's length bodies. Yeah, well, actually, most of um, uh, most European countries are, not, are less centralised than we are, uh, mm -hmm. in fact. So um, there's kind of, you know, there's more variation in some ways. Um, I think I would be kind of wary of, um, I understand what you're saying about, you know, having that choice can be, make things more difficult um, complicated for boards. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we know that, you know, one size doesn't fit all and there does need to be a range of 
um, options, I think, uh, for boards in terms of um, quality improvement methodologies and you know, for where they are on their journey and you know, what their sort of challenges are. Um, so I think maybe it's about providing better signposting to those different methodologies and what might be more appropriate uh, for um, you know, individual organisations. Um, I know we were in touch um, with uh, colleagues in Scotland uh, where you know, they were using the um, IHI uh, assessment of uh, boards and um, one of our team went um, and uh, you know, participated uh, in that and there's you know, quite a lot of um, uh, read across from that and I, I think that's used um, pretty widely um, uh, 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 across Scotland. Um, but I, I do think, I mean, there's definitely a role for, um, you know, whether it's the Health Foundation or, you know, NHS Improvement in slash England to, you know, point people in the, in the kind of right direction for them, um, uh, rather than just say, you know, this is the way, uh, this is the way to go. Um, and, uh, you know, we also need more evidence about um, some of these uh, approaches. Um, some of them have... Um, more robust evidence behind them than, than others. Great, thank you. I mean, I wasn't suggesting that uh, it should be mandated, but I think it's a really interesting debate to have. And I think one of the, my sense of um, one of the dilemmas that boards are facing at the moment is that they often have multiple different programmes of work going on within the trust. And so their dilemma is how to understand how to bring it all together. Yeah. Um, so they might often have two different, two or three at least, different types of QI improvement going on within the trust. Uh, might be involved in the Getting It Right First Time programme, for instance, um, or the Cultural and Leadership programme. And it's how to, I think the, ch the challenge they face is really how to integrate all these different bits, like you said, these pockets of great work into a more strategic approach. Um, so I'm just really interested in that. And I, I just wonder what other people think as well and what other people's experiences of that, because I do think it's a bit of a tension at the moment for English boards. Yeah, and I think having someone at, uh, at director level with some team that can help bring those elements together, uh, you're absolutely right. There are lots of different uh, initiatives um, and um, sort of bringing those together within, within an organisation and having a kind of approach for the organisation is, is um, would be really helpful. But yeah, it would be interesting to hear from others um, how, they're, how they're dealing with that. Can I come in? Can I come yep. in here? Oh, it's Katie. Hi. I've, in my experience, I, I think this is a real issue. I agree with you, Anna. And, um, and I've, I've been with a couple of trusts who have set up culture, culture committees at the level below the board. And the idea is that, um, that QI is part of that, but also the culture and leadership um, program is part of that. And it kind of works really, really well when they get to the point of having a, a small handful of, of key priorities, measurable, hopefully, which show that there's a sort of shift in culture and show that there is some improvement in, around some of the improvement programs. But it takes a terribly long time to, get, to build that governance structure, I think. And, um, and that doesn't usually happen unless the chief exec wants it to happen. So, so again, you know, you're fighting against the, the tide if there isn't an appetite at the top to really see culture and improvement as two sides of the same coin. Can I make a point here as well? Yes, please do. Yeah, I, 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 think, it, I think it's again part of the journey. There's people who will do no QI, then they reach a paradigm where they start doing QI projects. But I think it's quite important to keep highlighting that QI in organizations is not a series of QI projects. Uh, it might, there might be part of QI, but QI is a way of doing things. So what I keep telling people, even at board level is, it's not just about a series of uh, QI projects that we do, it's about saying, how we do things are in a QI way. So anything we do all across the organization has to be in a QI paradigm, rather than just saying it's a series of one project is there, another project is there. And I think that's quite important. That's perhaps a higher level of maturity, but I think people need to clearly understand that because then that gives you a bit of a headroom in terms of time. Otherwise people want stuff done by tomorrow or next month. 
whereas as we say this will easily take five to ten years really and i think i think that's the culture point that, that katie was making there manish um what what i what i'll do is i'll, I'll hand over to naomi, naomi if you want to make a final comment on on that conversation and I'm, I'm aware we are at we are at times so i don't want to hold up anyone any longer is there anything i should want to add in there yeah, no there? just that i think that 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 conversation is very um useful and yes Manesh, you're absolutely right it's about a, a, an overall approach for a whole organization um a moving um from individual particular projects to that organizational wide focus which is you know it's very challenging and as you say um uh, takes a long a long time it's very interesting hearing other people's uh, perceptions and experiences thank you Great. Well, um, thank you, Naomi, so much for giving up your time today. Really found it really, really helpful. And you're very kind because you've agreed to share um, slides with anyone who, who was on the call as well. Um, as ever, um, we tried to put on a variety of different topics um, for, for Q members and others uh, to engage with. I haven't seen the chat, but I know Matthew's been typing away talking to you as well. So um, thank you for your time. Um, do get in touch with us if you'd like to continue any of these conversations um, as well. So I'll, I'll end it there and uh, let you get all on with your day. Thank you very much and good sharing. Well, well good time keeping as well. Thanks, Manesh. Thanks, Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.